Well, good evening everyone and welcome to our Sunday evening service here at Alfred Place Baptist Church. My name is Eric Taylor. I'm part of the leadership team at the church. We're gl glad that you're able to uh, be with us this evening and we pray that God will encourage you as we seek to worship him together on what is the last Sunday uh, in the month of June. We're grateful to our audiovisual team, to uh, Chris, to Avion, and also to Guion, who uh, put these audiovisual presentations together for us and help us to worship God in this way. The notices for the week are fairly simple and straightforward. Tomorrow evening at 7.30, there will be a meeting, an online meeting of the Seekers group. Uh, this is a group for uh, teenagers, young people at secondary school. Do speak to uh, Hannah or to Phil Eiliff if you want uh, more information about how you can link into that gathering together online. Also, we have the prayer meeting on Tuesday, as usual, and on Friday afternoon. Uh, these meetings can be uh, uh, linked into uh, if you click on the, uh, the, the church bulletin for June. This evening, preaching for us, we have our old friend Reuben Saywell. Uh, Reuben was a student here at the university who then went to London Seminary. He's currently a church worker in uh, Maidenbower Baptist Church in the south of England. We're so pleased that uh, he's able to uh, preach God's word to us this evening. Well, let's hear some words from the Apostle Peter. At a time when people were discouraged in the world uh, and the churches to which he was writing. But he says this in his opening letter. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And then he goes on to talk about the trials that these Christians are facing. Difficult experiences, distressing times, anxiety, uncertainty, not knowing what a day will bring forth, perhaps feeling that God uh, is seemingly distant. Yet he says this, these trials, he says, have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Amen. Well, let's, uh, let's come to God in prayer. Let's all pray together. Our gracious Lord and loving Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time to meet together this evening in this way, this time when we can bring our praise and worship to you, eternal God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, Creator God, Redeemer God. We come to you this evening and pray, Lord, that you would bless our time of worship together and encourage us, we pray, in your word, helping us to live, Lord, those lives that you want us to live, that are pleasing to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we turn now to uh, our opening hymn. And it is, uh, Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, vast, unmeasured, boundless, free. If you can, you can stand and we'll praise God together. Mm -hmm. 
singing of that hymn we turn once again to God's word and we've been having responsive readings from the Psalms this evening I've chosen Psalm 91 to encourage our hearts the way we do this is that uh, I will read the odd numbered verses and you'll read the even numbered verses the verses I read will be in black and uh, the words that you read are in red. Let's hear the word of God together. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Surely, he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will not fear the terror of night nor the arrow that flies in the day. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near to you. If you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord, who is my refuge, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honour him 
Amen. Well, let's just uh, come to the Lord again in prayer. Father, we sang the words of that hymn, Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, vast, unmeasured, boundless, free. And we know, Lord, your great love for your people. We know that your church is the apple of your eye, your people whom you have knit together in Christ Jesus. How we rejoice, Lord, in the fellowship of believers. And though at the present time this has been disrupted because of the virus and all the implications that this pandemic has brought upon the nation of Wales and even in our little town here, uh, we've not been completely unscathed of this virus. But Lord, we thank you that you have protected us here in large measure and that you've protected our church. And uh, we pray, Lord, that you continue to look after us until that day when we can gather again in uh, the building that you've given to us and worship you there. Lord, we long for that. We yearn for that day. And yet we know at this time we are constrained. But we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would continue to bless us. Don't let us get discouraged like those folk at, uh, to whom Peter was writing so long ago now. They were your people too, but they had been pressed down by many trials and tribulations and difficulties and discouragements. Lord, lift us up, we pray, if we're discouraged at this time. Help us to look to you. Help us to look to our great Redeemer, in whom we find grace and truth. Help us, Lord, to put our faith, a complete faith, in your will and ways for us at this time. And help us, Lord, still to rejoice. Rejoice that our King reigns in Zion. We thank you that your church is a glorious church. We thank you that your kingdom on earth is an indestructible kingdom that it's an ever growing kingdom in this world and that you will accomplish that great calling that you have given to the church to serve you and to preach this glorious gospel of the lord jesus christ help us then again this evening now Tonight's message comes from the letter of 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and we'll be reading from verse 1 to verse 10. So if you've got your copy of God's word, please turn to that passage and we'll read these 10 verses together. It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast, except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool. For I will speak the truth, but I refrain lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, 
then I am strong. Amen. Well, let us come before God in prayer. Gracious Father, we come before you humbly this evening, asking that you might teach us from this passage. We thank you that you have not left us in the dark, but that you have given us your word, which is a a light to our feet and a lamp to our path. And Father, we pray that we might know this light in our life this evening. We pray that you might bring us along in our Christian walk. We pray that with all that is going on around us, that we might know for sure that your grace is sufficient for us and that your strength is made powerful in weakness. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the principal objections that is made against the existence of a loving God is the presence of pain. Uh, The headlines now, more than ever, seem to be uh, just an endless cycle of bad news. Uh, You pull up the news reports on your computer screens or on your phones and it it won't take you long to find them. Uh, COVID-19 is everywhere. There are riots. There are violent protests. There are There is unrest, there is injustice everywhere that we turn. And your question might be, well, why would an all-powerful, all-loving God allow such things to happen in his world? It really is the biggest argument that is used against God in every age of history. And yet the Bible provides the answer in more ways than one, on, on many occasions, That God has done something and that God will do something and that God is doing something in the present. And tonight I'd like us to to build upon that answer. Discovering through the experience of the Apostle Paul the purpose of suffering. What it is that this man learnt in the midst of a particular trial that, that marked the course of his life. Uh, Maybe if you're a parent this evening, you uh, remember uh, that day that you first took your child for their uh, vaccinations. Uh, Perhaps I'm resurfacing some painful memories as you remember well, looking into the face of your cheerful, trusting baby who uh, all of a sudden gets the needle jammed into their arm and the lower lip begins to quiver and their eyes fill with tears and it breaks our hearts. And yet we know as parents that though they cannot understand it then, uh, this is for their long-term good. And the purpose is not just to hurt them, in fact, it is not to hurt them, but it is to help them. And that is the picture of suffering. That is Paul's experience. Uh, one commentator said that this is the most personal, the most emotionally charged and autobiographical letter that the apostle ever penned. Well, here in chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians, Paul has been made the target of attacks. He has had these uh, attacks launched against him by his opponents, these self-designated so-called super apostles, whose entire goal was to, to undermine and to overthrow Paul's authority in the Corinthian congregation. And these people uh, were themselves counterfeits they were frauds and yet they were constantly boasting in their personal credentials in their spiritual experiences and their ministerial accomplishments and the claim was simply that Paul had no comparative experience he had nothing to to boast of and yet as Paul writes to answer his critics to prove to them that he truly was sent by God He shows them his weakness. It is a strange line of defense, isn't it? Of all the qualifications that the Apostle Paul could have listed before them, he showed them his weakness. Now, what is the intention in that? Well, it is to show that divine power is manifested through weakness. But before we jump to verse 7, we need to look behind the scenes at the experience that prompted Paul to receive this thorn in his flesh. 
In verse 2, he introduces us to himself in the third person, doesn't he? He says, I know a man who in Christ 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Now that is a reference not just to a place way up in space or high up in the sky. But this is the invisible dwelling place of God. He is speaking about heaven itself. That's where Paul was transported to. And the passage tells us that here he hears things too wonderful for words. Inexpressible things were revealed to him. It was an extraordinary revelation. And yet he doesn't say anything more about it. Paul could drag on the story, couldn't he? If this was you or I, we might have bragged and boasted in such a vision. And yet Paul doesn't do that. Not only does he keep it brief, But then for 14 long years, he kept his mouth shut. He never made this experience a focus of his ministry. Well, it is this vision of paradise that sets the scene for the display of his weakness. Because the turning point then comes in verse 7, where we discover that the visit to heaven is accompanied by a visit to hell. Or a visit from hell. Paul is brought down from his high and holy experience with a bump. And verse 7 says, to keep me from being conceited or, or lest I should be exalted because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. This is the first observation. Before we look at the promise and the purpose of the thorn, uh, let us consider firstly the pain of the thorn. Now I'm sure it goes without saying that when we speak about a thorn, uh, Paul is not speaking about a run-in with a thorny bush. Uh, It is a metaphor to a painful problem. And bear in mind that that Paul has only just finished referring to, at the end of chapter 11, uh, the sufferings that he has endured for the sake of of Christ. He speaks at the end of that chapter about the shipwreck and the floggings and the imprisonment and the, the stonings, the cold, hunger and thirst. But the thing that he makes mention of now here in verse 7 comes out on top. This blows the rest of his sufferings out of the water. A painful thorn had pierced his flesh. You know, don't you, that suffering is an indispensable part of living in a fallen world. It is inescapable. And this pandemic that we are living through, it may be novel for us, but the history books are full of other plagues and outbreaks that have swept our nation off its feet. You see, the Church of Christ has not been given a force field of immunity against this virus. No, we too are part of the mix of those who suffer. In fact, it is often those who are in the church, those who are believers in Christ, who suffer more than anybody in the world. And Jesus makes that clear in his invitation, doesn't he? That following Christ is is not a free ticket to an easy life, but rather it is just the beginning of a lifetime of difficulty. It's why uh, prosperity preachers and so-called faith healers, they, they have a hard time with a chapter like 2 Corinthians 12. Because Paul's thorn, though it is painful, it is not on account of a lack of faith, but rather it serves a purpose. A Paul's suffering, as it is for all who truly follow after Christ, is inevitable. And the imagery that is used here of a thorn is is relevant because of what it symbolizes. You you remember how in Genesis chapter 3, immediately following on from the fall, as God delivers the curse to mankind, thorns and thistles are sent alongside this curse. They are a consequence of sin. Uh, Even today, to refer to someone as a, a thorn in the flesh is another way of calling them a pain in the neck. It's not a a nice way of speaking about somebody or something. 
And yet that is how Paul refers to his affliction. Its very presence was, was crippling his enjoyment of life. It was sapping out the energy. It was draining all the goodness and the enjoyment of his life. It was hindering his productivity. Now, Paul could have said something like this. He, he could have said, oh, well, I of all people need to be in good health. I cannot afford to get sick. Oh, God needs me to counteract this false doctrine that is sweeping throughout Corinth. He needs me to, to stand up for the truth of Jesus Christ. And yet God's response is to remind him that the gospel does not rest on his shoulders. Maybe you're a, a sports fan and you're uh, sat back watching your team on the TV and suddenly uh, the star player is taken out and he is stretched off to the sideline with a serious injury. And now you and all the fans are, are wondering how on earth the, the team will possibly uh, play on and succeed without this star player. Well, in a spiritual sense, that is often how we tend to view the Apostle Paul, isn't it? If we were to identify one man as being truly a super apostle, it would be him, wouldn't it? You think of how much more effective his ministry could have been without the thorn. How many more people could he have won for the Lord Jesus Christ in the city of Corinth and further afield if he did not have this thorn? And yet even he was given a thorn because even the best of men are men at best. But what is the thorn? Well, there are no shortage of uh, PhD papers and thoughts and theories uh, on the identity of the thorn. But the bottom line is the text just doesn't say. We, we are not told. Uh, Paul keeps his suffering intentionally and deliberately vague. And nonetheless, a multitude of explanations have been put forward but by and large, in the history of the church, uh, Christians have adopted one of, of two views. Uh, firstly, they say that Paul is speaking of a physical affliction. Or secondly, that he is speaking about a, an individual or a group of individuals. Now, in that first category, commentators have drawn on uh, Galatians chapter 6, when Paul makes the comment about writing with, with large letters, seemingly indicating that he had some kind of persistent eye problem. Now, perhaps it was stemming from his encounter with the bright light on the road to Damascus when he was converted. Others, they put it down to some disease or, or disability or, or even chronic depression. But then in the category of an individual, it doesn't take you long to see that Paul was a man hotly pursued by enemies. His writing is, is punctuated by the fact that there are people out to destroy his ministry. They want to tear him down. He was a, a persecuted man. I mean, you just need to read all the way through the epistles and the book of Acts to see that the, the apostle Paul was a man who truly suffered. His opponents are, are shadowing his every move. Every church he plants is being infiltrated and infected by these false teachers and their false doctrine. Well, if the thorn in the flesh was an individual or a group of opponents, that would also fit in with the way that the Old Testament metaphorically uses the word thorn. Uh, if you read the book of Numbers, you will see how uh, the Lord warns the nation of Israel that if they do not drive the Canaanites out of the land, that they would become thorns in their flesh. And so we too may apply that to Paul's particular affliction. Perhaps you've got your own ideas about what this thorn was uh, this evening. But you see, the identity of the affliction is irrelevant to what Paul is trying to say. In fact, the only other information that he gives is that the thorn was given by way of a messenger of Satan. And notice that Paul is, is firstly pointing in God's direction. He gave me this thorn. Yes, the pain came via Satan, but ultimately it was sent by God. Now, the key is found in verse 7 again. It was given to me 
uh, to keep me from being conceited, lest I be exalted above measure. Now, do you think that Satan would give the Apostle Paul something to keep him from pride? Well, there's no chance, is there? There was no way, there was, there was nothing that Satan wanted more than for Paul to fall. Of all the men in the world, Satan was out for the Apostle Paul. And so the fact that the thorn was given to prevent pride is proof, I believe, that the thorn was given by God. And Paul, he doesn't uh, feel the need to go in any further or to qualify that uh, fact Uh, The way that uh, God the Father often will give his children a gift by an evil means. And why does he not go into that more? Well, I think it is because this pattern recurs uh, repeatedly throughout the Bible. Uh, The most obvious example being in our Lord Jesus Christ, who was delivered up by sinful men to die upon the cross at Calvary in order to secure salvation for all those who believe in him. You see how the pain of the crucifixion was in the overarching plan and purpose and redemptive plan of God. Something painful was to secure something glorious. What a comfort that is to uh, those of us who are living in such difficult days. And I know that Members of this congregation in Aberystwyth are, are suffering at this time. What a, what a privilege it is to know that God, in his absolute sovereignty, can work even satanically delivered thorns for our good. I think we're already seeing glimpses of good that have come through this virus, haven't we? You may have heard about the the, the wonders that this has done for our planet in terms of decreasing pollution levels and the the positive news for climate change. Well, There is also that sense of community, isn't there, and solidarity that has been shown by many up and down our country throughout these past few months. We seem to have come together as a nation more now than ever. But notice also how the idols of sport and consumerism and many others have been toppled or at least they've been temporarily suspended until the virus is under control now it is not to diminish the sorrow but God has brought joy from sadness and that is Paul's perspective as he as he wrestles with this thorn in his flesh he is looking beyond the pain and there he sees divine providence He sees that God is never the author of evil, but under his sovereign supreme control, he permits sometimes the messenger of Satan, whatever form this may have taken in the Apostle Paul's life, to harass him. It is the picture of a man in a boxing ring being uh, repeatedly punched by his opponents down to the canvas. That is the intensity with which this thorn has invaded Paul's space but then look secondly from the pain to the promise of the thorn Uh, a small fishing boat is caught in the midst of a perfect storm it is being battered by the waves it is beginning to break apart and it is sinking fast and those aboard they reach for the radio and they send an emergency distress signal uh, alert to the coast guard and the response of the Coast Guard to the call uh, to help, uh, for help is to rush to the rescue. You see, when you find yourself in danger, sometimes the only thing that you can do is to call that four-letter word, help. And so it ought to be with prayer. There are times, aren't there, when we are so desperate, when we feel so emotionally broken by trials, That the words just don't seem to come. And all we can seem to pray is, Lord, help me. Uh, We call them arrow prayers, don't we? They are quick shots fired towards heaven. You see, in your pain, God does not require that you pray uh, theologically rich, neat and tidy prayers. It is not about the word count, but it is about the sincerity of our hearts. 
It is why the writer to the Hebrews urged suffering believers, come boldly to the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in times of need. Well, that was Paul's first response in verse 8. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Now, Paul doesn't seek a, a, a quick fix in his own strength. No, he runs back and forth to God. But notice also how his three prayers for help, uh, those heart cries, they seem to echo the prayers of Jesus in Gethsemane when he was there uh, before he went to, to Calvary. When he prayed, Lord, if there is any other way, take this cup from me. Well, Paul believed, as we do, that God answers prayer. But this ninth verse teaches us that sometimes the answer is no. Instead of giving Paul what he wanted, God gave him what he needed. And Paul's help came in the form of a promise. Just as Jesus was, was strengthened in that garden to face the cross, so strength was made available to Paul to face the thorn. And here in verse 12, we see the rose among the thorns. A promise that is given to Paul, but a, a promise that is for all of us who are in Christ Jesus this evening. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Now there are two promises that you can see here. The first of which is God's sufficient grace. Now, God doesn't offer therapy, does he? But grace. Uh, the word grace, now I haven't counted this to verify it, but supposedly it appears 155 times throughout the New Testament. And here once more in this chapter, it takes centre stage. And it is not just a slither of grace that is promised here to Paul, is it? It is not just a little bit of grace to kind of give Paul a kick start so that he can start to rebuild his life again. No, this is sufficient grace for the beginning, middle and end of his life. Paul is underscoring the fullness and freeness of God's grace and that it is sufficient to deal with whatever comes his way. And you know, friends, there is nothing in your life and mine Nothing that we will ever need that God is not willing and able to supply. I wonder, do you view God's grace as sufficient to deal with the, the, the problems and afflictions that you are facing this, this evening? I wonder, do you view God's grace as sufficient to deal with this global pandemic? Well, it is. Nothing is impossible with God. And that's the second promise that is given a strengthening power. My power is made perfect in weakness. Oh, that is a loaded statement, isn't it? In other words, the Apostle Paul, or, God, or rather God is saying to the Apostle Paul in his weakness that it is not about the revelations, but it is about his weakness that becomes the platform for demonstrating his matchless power. Now, Paul did not enjoy we mustn't for one moment think that Paul enjoyed the pain that came through this thorn. And yet he could embrace it as the means by which God was resting his power upon him. Uh, this is the cornerstone for the Christian life. Uh, do you embrace your weakness, believing it to be the means of displaying God's matchless grace and power in your life? Well, you might not get the answer that you're looking for. Uh, the Lord may choose not to remove the thorn in your flesh. Uh, and yet he has promised what he promised to Paul. To you this evening, he gives strengthening power and or rather sufficient grace and strengthening power. Well, then finally, uh, what about the purpose of the thorn? What is the purpose of the thorn? The story is told of a young girl 
Uh, she's the daughter of a silversmith who went to her father's workplace to watch the process of refining silver. And she entered the workshop and she sat from a distance as her father picked up a piece of silver with his steel tongs. And he held it in the middle of the fire where the flames were hottest and then just sat there carefully waiting. Just in case the silver was left for a moment too long in the flames and, and totally destroyed. And the young girl, she was curious and she, so she asked her father, oh, Father, how do you know? When the silver is fully refined, to which he replied, when I see my image on it. Now, why do I use that story? Well, because it echoes the way that God sits as a refiner of silver. That is what we read in the Old Testament prophecy of Malachi, that God sits as a refiner and purifier of silver. That is God's purpose in suffering. God sometimes seems to hold us right in the hot spot where the flames are hottest, in the middle of the furnace of affliction, like the refiner who sits before the furnace, but never for too long, only until his image is seen upon it. Now, we could spend hours this evening tracing the purpose of suffering from the beginning to the end of Scripture. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 6 through 11 speaks of suffering as being an act of divine discipline. It is painful, but later it yields the fruits of righteousness for those who have been trained by it. Or 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 16 through 18 speaks of pain as preparation for the eternal weight of glory. Now we could go on, couldn't we? And yet I would like to briefly just highlight three of the purposes that shine through our passage in, in response to Paul's thorn in the flesh. Firstly, it was to keep him humble. Secondly, to keep him dependent. And thirdly, to keep him praising. A.W. Tozer said, before God can use a man greatly, he must wound him deeply. Take a look back at the first and the last line of verse 7. Twice Paul looks back and he highlights that the purpose for his suffering is to keep him from being conceited. That is purpose number one. God has allowed this thorn to pierce his flesh to keep him humble. And we must wonder whether one of the main purposes for COVID-19 and the spread of it across the world is that God is humbling our world. In the 21st century, with all of our vast technological advancement, with all of our medical expertise, we are being overwhelmed by something so small that can only be seen under a microscope. We are living in a culture that, that loves to boast in its growth and its progress. And yet, over these past months, we have had to face up to the fact of our own weakness and helplessness. Though this virus has, is beginning to slow down, we are still at risk, aren't we? And none of us are, are, are safe from contracting it. And as God uses the fires of suffering to burn away Paul's pride and his self-confidence, so we must conclude that he may be doing that for us today. It is counterintuitive, isn't it? But suffering is sometimes a good and necessary agency to, to bring about the sweet fruit of humility in your life. Uh, it really is hard, isn't it, to feel invincible and on top of the world and proud when you're flat out on a hospital bed or you're facing the uncertainty of life or you're bruised and broken and pierced by a thorn in your flesh. And yet often that is how far God must take us. At times he must confront us as he did for the Apostle Paul of our weakness in order that we might see the sufficiency of his grace and the strength of his power. The Bible says that we have three main enemies, doesn't it? The world, the flesh, and the devil. Uh, we spend so much time talking about how bad the world is. 
and how malicious and evil Satan is, that we are prone, I believe, to letting the worst enemy of all slip in unnoticed. And that is the flesh. And Paul has reached the point where he has recognised that sometimes God gives us thorns to protect you from you. But the second purpose of pain follows on, and that is to keep you dependent. You see, the Bible doesn't advocate a stoic form of passive resignation to suffering and affliction. Instead, the purpose of the thorn is to pin you closer to Christ. It is why Spurgeon said, I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. And that is what happens with this apostle. He discovered through all of this what he would never have known apart from this. He walked in closer dependence with Christ. He saw more of him and his grace and his power in his weakness than he ever did in his strength. And ultimately he was brought to the point where he could say, I'd far rather, to ha- I'd far rather have Christ with the thorn than a thornless life without Christ. And some of you tonight, uh, you bear the scars of suffering uh, physically Mentally, spiritually, perhaps you've got stories to tell of of times of deep darkness. And yet, if you are a believer, it is very likely that Paul's testimony is your testimony. uh, That the thorns that have left you with scars, they serve as an amazing reminder of a time that your faith was once shaken, but was ultimately made stronger well finally the purpose is to keep you praising have a look at verse 10 for the sake of christ then i am content with weaknesses insults hardships persecutions and calamities for when i am weak then i am strong imagine having your face pressed up to a stained glass window what would that look like well, it would look random, it would look messy, it would look, mis- uh, it would look disjointed, it wouldn't make any sense, would it? It would just be a, a splash of, of colours. But what happens when you take a few steps back from that stained glass window? Well, now as the light catches it, uh, you can appreciate and you can marvel at the intricacy and the artistic skill and the beauty and the detail of that stained glass window. Now you might feel as though you're in the thick of suffering this evening. The thorn may be pressing deeply into your flesh and just like when you've got your face pressed up to that window, it may just make no sense to you. And you think, Lord, why are you bringing this into my life? Why have you afflicted me in this way? It might seem random, it might seem purposeless and yet look at what Paul has done. He has taken steps back. And he has heard the promise and he has been humbled and made dependent upon God. And now he is content and he marvels at the intricacy of God's purpose in pain. And look at him in verse 10. He praises God for the thorn. And so so must we this evening. Even in the midst of this season of trial, uh, one way or another, We must trust that not only does God know what he is doing, but that even when we are at our weakest, God is full of grace and full of power. Amen.
cross of shame, set our cold hearts aflame with love for you, our Saviour and our Master, who on that lonely day bore all our sins away and saved us from the judgment and disaster. Lord, encourage us as uh, we've met together this evening, build us up in our faith, strengthen us, we pray, for Christ's sake. Amen.